Okay, if we could turn, please, in our Bibles to the book of Esther and the third chapter. We're going to read the entire chapter. It's only 15 verses. And so beginning in verse 1, it says, After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, uh, the Agagite, and advanced him, and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed, and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman, to see whether Mordecai's matter, matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai, Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. In the first month, that is the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur, that is the lot, before Haman from day to day and from month to month, so that the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar, and Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all people, neither keep they the king's laws. Uh, therefore, it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it unto the king's treasuries. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. And the king said unto Haman, the silver is given to thee, the people also to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. Then were the king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors that were over every province, to the rulers of every people of every province, according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language in the name of King Ahasuerus was it written and sealed with the king's ring. And the letters were sent by posts into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey, the copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all the people that they should be ready against that day. The post went out, being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan, the palace, and the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city, Shushan, was perplexed. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us. And our title this morning is Attempted Genocide. Basically, that's what's going on in this chapter. And as we already observed, the book of Esther is really quite remarkable. Uh, if you think of what we've considered so far, we've seen a messy royal divorce. Uh, we've seen an empire-wide beauty pageant. We've seen a royal wedding. We've seen a foiled assassination attempt. And today, we're going to see an attempted genocide and the plans put into motion. And it really is like reading uh, the tabloid newspapers or uh, watching the news, uh, seeing all of these things. These are all things that we're familiar with from our own society and our own culture. And what it tells us is this, that first of all, the word of God is very relevant to every 
generation because these things have happened in some of our lifetimes. We've seen some of these things, but also it tells us that the heart of man doesn't change. It's the same since the fall of Adam, the heart of man has been incurably evil from generation to generation. And so all of these things that we're seeing are things that um, are seen in our culture uh, in terms of genocide. Uh, we, we see it in scripture, Pharaoh in Egypt seeking to uh, eradicate the Jews. Uh, we, we, we've seen it in history. Uh, some of the some of us forget some of them, but there was a there was a, the, what we call the Armenian genocide uh, that took place uh, by the Turks against the Armenians, and uh, that was a, a, an amazing thing. In fact, it was so perplexing uh, to God's people that some of the people of God at that time were caused to to write books like the a, a tremendous book, The Silence of God, by Sir Robert Anderson. Was was really addressing that issue. How can this uh, this massacre uh, take place and God do nothing, seemingly do nothing uh, to to intervene? And so Robert Anderson wrote the book, The Silence of God, in answer to the Armenian genocide. We forget about that. The Holocaust, uh, of course, the Armenian genocide that was around about 1917 uh, when that took place. Uh, the uh, the uh, of course the Holocaust in Nazi Germany, the attempt to eradicate the Jews. Uh, more recently in Rwanda, remember the Hutsis and the Tutsis and all that kind of thing. Uh, the, these are things that we've witnessed in in in. Uh, and again, uh, who's behind it ultimately? Satan hates man who is made in the image and likeness of God, and he has come to steal, kill and to destroy. And so that's what he wants to do, destroy the human race. And that's his plan. That's his goal. So it's interesting that this chapter uh, introduces to us uh, the Old Testament Hitler, if we like, Haman. Uh, that's what some have called him, the Old Testament Hitler. But uh, the, the Feast of Purim that uh, is commemorated to this day amongst Jews in remembrance of these events that we're studying, it, when the, the Book of Esther is always read in the synagogue during the Feast of Purim. And every time the name of Haman is mentioned, the people stamp their feet, they hiss, and then they say this, may his name be blotted out <laughs> and of course it's kind of a very dramatic thing uh, but that goes on to this very day uh, when the book of esther is read during the synagogue during uh, the feast of purim and to jews everywhere haman personifies everybody who has tried to exterminate the people of israel and this chapter explains to us why haman was such a dangerous man so it begins with after these things in verse one. And what it's telling us is that since the, the plot uh, to uh, assassinate the king had been discovered, uh, there's a, a time lapse. And actually, it's a time lapse of five years. Uh, we know that because in chapter two, verse 16, we read Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus, unto his house royal, in the 10th month, which is the month Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. So we've got the seventh year of the reign of King Ahasuerus. And when we look at chapter 3, uh, we will observe in verse 7, in the first month, that is the month Nisan, in the 12th year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur. Okay, so we've, we've got this, this elapse, a uh, five-year period from the seventh year to the 12th year of the reign. So after these things, so uh, Esther's been married five years, uh, things have gone on in the kingdom, and then these events take place. We're now introduced in the narrative to the man who would become known as the Jew's enemy or this wicked Haman. I want us just to observe that. Chapter three, verse 10, the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. Chapter 8, verse 1. On that day did the king Ahasuerus give the house of Haman, the Jew's enemy. There he is mentioned again. 
chapter 9 and verse 10. The ten sons of Haman, the sons of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. Verse 24 of chapter 9. Because Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews. And then back in chapter 7, verse 6, Esther said, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. So this is who this man is, the enemy of the Jews, this wicked Haman. The name Haman means magnificent. And it's kind of an interesting word because, uh, again, if you know anything about etymology of words, a, a, a lot of words come out of the same root. So the idea of magnify magnificent and so the idea is that he is somebody his name means somebody who's blown up made to look bigger he's magnified he's magnificent and certainly uh, this man had an ego that was certainly inflated and blown up and he certainly lived up to his name he thought he was someone very very special and so although he wasn't the king this man was powerful all he had to do was make a proposal, and the king was willing to endorse it without question. Uh, whatever Haman suggested, the king would give him the signet ring and say, go ahead, you do it. And so we can see he's a very powerful individual. And we can see uh, Haman, uh, in Haman, without difficulty, all the hallmarks of Satan. Haman is like Satan in this way, his desire for high honor. He wants to be like the most high. And this man, uh, when later on in the book, when he, what, what should we do with the man the king delights to honor? In Haman's mind, there's only one person the king would ever want to honor. That's him. He, again, he's just full of self and wants that position of elevation, uh, high honor. He's ambitious. He's proud. Uh, he's not content with just being who he is. He wants to be uh, like the Most High, and he was, we're told, an Agagite, which could mean uh, there was a district in the empire known as Agag, but most Jewish scholars and most Christian scholars actually believe that he was descended from Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And if you remember, when Saul was tasked with the job of eradicating the Amalekites, he spared Agag. Now, later on, uh, he was hacked to pieces uh, by Samuel, uh, but he obviously didn't see the Amalekites as quite the threat and was willing to spare Agag. Well, somehow a descendant of Agag has come back. And remember, Mordecai was a Benjamite. And so we've got kind of a rehash of that old story. Saul Agag, failing to, to take seriously God's command to wipe them out. Now it's come back to haunt the descendants of Saul, so to speak. And so, of course, the Amalekites have been the bitter enemies of Israel ever since the early days after the exodus from Egypt. And we want to just remind ourselves uh, again of the Amalekites. Their, their picture, the flesh, uh, the perpetual enemy of the people of God, and if we just look uh, just briefly, we know this, uh, this is just review, reminder, we've looked at this in other contexts, but just good to keep reminding ourselves of uh, the Amalekites. And so in uh, Exodus 17, uh, just uh, after the rock had been smitten and the water had been poured out, poured out uh, again, a picture of Christ's death and then the giving of the Holy Spirit, it says in verse 8, then came Amalek of Exodus 17, and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And it really is true. When somebody trusts Christ and they uh, get saved and the Spirit of God comes to live within them, uh, immediately Amalek begins to attack and begins to seek to oppose the great work that God has done in that person's life. And it, another scripture that has a bearing on this is Deuteronomy 25. And I find this one very, very insightful in Deuteronomy 25, where we get, again, the description of this battle. 
and uh, verse 17, it says, remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way, when you were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God. Therefore it shall be, when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt not forget it. And so basically, uh, when did Amalek attack and who did he attack? Well, it was the weary, the stragglers, the ones that were at the back and the ones that were tired from the journey. And certainly we know from experience that when we're tired and we're weary, the old flesh tends to come to us and say, well, you can find some relief and some satisfaction from your weariness and your tiredness by imbibing in things that Amalek, the filth that he would want us uh, to be involved with. And so, again, we're, we're told God had said in, in Exodus 17 that, that uh, he would always have war with Amalek. And certainly this perpetual warfare we see throughout the scripture. And so Amalek, a descendant. So you can see why this man, Haman, would hate the Jews because the Amalekites hate the Jews. And of course, because of Agag, his descendant being wiped out, uh, you could see why he would want uh, them destroyed because God's command to the Israelites is to wipe out the memory of Amalek from the face of the earth. So you could see why he is so agitated. By the way, uh, Amalek is also a descendant of Esau, <laughs> again, a man who hated uh, his righteous brother. Genesis 36, verse 12, uh, it says, Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bare to Eliphaz, Amalek. These were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. And so, again, a, a direct descendant of Esau, that profane person. We're told in the New Testament about Esau, that profane person. And again, that word profane, uh, it's an interesting word, it, profanum, it means no sanctuary. And the idea was that in Esau's heart, there was no room for God. No sanctuary, no place for God in his life. And again, a profane person is someone who has no place for God because he is the God of his life, the individual is. So there's no room for the God of the Bible, the God of revelation in his life. A profane person has no sanctuary in his life, no place for God, because he has become the God of his life. So everything about Haman is hateful. Uh, uh, he's proud, he's arrogant, he hates the people of God. Uh, everything about Haman uh, can be described uh, in the book of Proverbs by uh, what God hates. Everything that Haman was is what God hates. Uh, and if you look at Proverbs chapter six, just an amazing little section of scripture that describes Haman to a T, really perfectly, verse 16 down to verse 19. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, well, certainly that would fit the description of Haman. A lying tongue, uh, when he describes the Jews, he uses slander. He's not exactly accurate in his description. There's some truth in it, but there's uh, also deceit in it. Hands that shed innocent blood. Remember, he wants all the Jews killed, including women and children. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. He's constantly coming up with schemes and plots. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord among brethren. Well, that sounds a lot like Haman to me. And it says, these six things, yea, seven, God hates. Keep those seven evil characteristics in mind as we read the book of Esther and as we 
consider this man Haman. So verse two, it says, and all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, but the king had so commanded concerning him. We said, whatever this man said, the king would, would give uh, him his desires. And so he asked the king, seeing as I'm elevated to this position, would everybody bow down and reverence me? And the king said, yes. And so the king gave this commandment. Again, shows how weak the king was, that, and again, that he was so easily influenced uh, by uh, this man. So Mordecai refuses to do this. Again, in verse 2, it says, Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. So here we've got a little bit of a problem. Mordecai refuses to acknowledge Haman. He refuses to bow, even though everyone else apart from the king seemed happy to do this. Could a Jew bow in worship and homage to a proud and arrogant Amalekite or to any man? It was unthinkable. Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Now, we've got to think about what, what's involved here, because at other times we, we see people have no difficulty. In fact, we look at some references to people bowing before rulers and authorities uh, that uh, that is perfectly legitimate so what what's different about this some think it's just that he well he was an amalekite and that old enmity between a benjamite and amalekite is going on here but the words bowed down or bowed and reverenced i think help us to understand what is going on here you see, the word bowed, uh, Hebrew word kara, it means to prostrate oneself. And that's the normal one where, you know, people would uh, bow down before the queen or curtsy or whatever. Uh, it's just to, to, to show uh, respect to authority. Uh, that, that word is the, the, just the normal word. And we find that uh, in, in scripture where people are happy to do that uh, to those in authority. But then this word reverence. Uh, it says, and reverenced Haman, uh, and it says, nor did him reverence. It's a different word. It's the word shaka, and it literally means worship. It's a man lying flat on the earth with hands and feet extended in worship. <laughs> and this is where Mordecai is saying, I can't go there. I cannot do that. Haman expected that he would be worshipped as divine, which was not unusual in Persian kings or in other, uh, one of the great difficulties the Christians faced in the New Testament was burning incense and stating Caesar is Lord. Uh, they found that very difficult because they, they knew somebody else was Lord, Jesus was Lord. And so this is what's involved. This is, this is like uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refusing to bow to the image because it's really an image of the king there, there's no way they can do that and so uh, he absolutely refuses uh, to bow uh, to prostrate himself on the ground implying the highest degree of reverence that can be paid to god or man laying flat on the earth hands and feet extended and the mouth in the dust. He said, I can't do that. I'm going to take my stand with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, what's interesting is that it seems that Haman didn't even notice initially. It's not Haman that, that is aware of this, because it says, then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said to Mordecai, why transgressest thou the king's commandment? So it's the king's servants that notice he's not bowing. Now, maybe there's some jealousy, maybe there's some competition here, but they notice that he's not willing to bow. And verse 4, now it came to pass when they spake daily to him, and he hearkened not to them. So they're, they're encouraging him, you, you need to do this, you need to bow down, that they told him and to see whether Mordecai's matter would stand. For he had told them that he was a Jew. His explanation is plain and simple. I can't do it because... I'm a Jew. Lingering in his soul was the grand truth. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Such fidelity must have given pleasure to the heart of God. This man is not prepared to bow. 
Mordecai had declared to those who asked him the reason why he didn't fall down before Haman, that he could not do so was simply because he was a Jew. As a Jew, he could not show that honor to man that was due to God alone. Now, again, we said it's okay to show respect and reverence to kings, but not to worship them. And so let's just look at some examples of that in Scripture where, where we see uh, that there is reverence shown, but it's not the word that is given here that implies worship. Second Samuel 14, verse 4. It says, and when the woman of Tekoa spake to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and did obeisance and said, help, O king. So there, woman falling before David. Second Samuel 18 and verse 28. Again, we see an, um, an uh, Ahimas uh, called and said to the king, all is well, and he fell down to the earth upon his face before the king and said, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which hath delivered up the men that lifted up their hand against my lord, the king. So again, somebody fell down to the earth upon his face before the king. First Kings uh, chapter 1 and verse 16, we read about Bathsheba. And it says, And Bathsheba bowed and did obeisance unto the king. And the king said, what wouldest thou? And so, again, we see that it's, it's not unusual, uh, and it's okay for us to acknowledge uh, and, and uh, show proper respect to people in authority, um, but we cannot bow and worship them as divine. Haman is an obvious foreshadowing of the final enemy of Israel, whose image all will be required to bow down to and worship on the pain of death. Revelation chapter 13. Just as the early church faced this issue of having to comply and say Caesar is Lord, the church at the end of the, or the people in the tribulation period more precisely, uh, the tribulation saints will be faced with the same issue. Uh, can they bow and give worship to the image of the beast and of course they can't and because of that they will suffer with the loss of their lives and so in verse 5 it says and when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not nor did him reverence then was Haman full of wrath this insignificant Jew was stubbornly refusing to pay him reverence it enraged his proud and vain man and again there's there's a basic insecurity about somebody who is wrapped up in self haman was proud and insecure man and he could only consider himself to be a success if everyone else thought he was a success from that time on haman watched mordecai and nursed his anger not only towards the man at the gate mordecai but also to all the Jews in the empire. And so from verse 6, we see now this plot beginning to develop to wipe out, to, to commit genocide, to wipe out the entire Jewish people. And so it says in verse 6, he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. It was that wouldn't satisfy his hurt pride just to deal with Mordecai, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Again, they had showed him. And so obviously, uh, amongst the, the princes that were uh, 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 the king's servants, there was this, this anti-Semitic feeling amongst them as well. And so they had showed Haman, uh, the people of Mordecai, wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. And so again, this is this is this is huge, right? This attempt to wipe out the entire Jewish race, what that behind that we've got to recognize is that through this race, through Abraham's seed, and then through a descendant of David, one was to come who would be the savior of the world. And so you can see behind 
the scenes. And we've got to keep looking behind the scenes in the book of Esther. Behind the scenes, not only God is working, but we also know behind the scenes, the, the enemy of men's souls is also working. Uh, the one who deceives the nations is working. And if he can wipe out the Jewish people, the, the one who will ultimately crush his head will not come into the world, the Messiah. So Haman is planning to destroy all the Jews throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. And so, because again, these people were superstitious uh, to the core, uh, he, they, they want to know the, the lucky day to do the act. Right? What's the best day to do it? And so there's this need uh, to cast lots to find out when this day for the execution of the Jews will take place. And this is where we see the God of Israel being in control. We're going to see this, that, that actually when they cast the lots, I'm sure they're eager to get this deed done, but we find that the lots cause a tremendous delay, actually a, almost 12 months. And so it says verse 7, in the first month, that is the month Nisan, in the 12th year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pur. That is the lot before Haman from day to day and from month to month to the 12th month, that is the month Adar. So this casting of pur, uh, it's uh, pur is just the Persian word for the lot. Uh, and again, it's something like dice or used to leave a, uh, a decision. Uh, which day is it going to be? Is it going to be this day? And whichever way it turns, uh, it would determine the day it was going to be on. And so Haman was awaiting the guidance, basically, of the diviners, the astrologers, while they cast lots to determine the most auspicious or lucky day in which this evil plan would be executed. And just to show that this was, this is how people in the East thought. Uh, they, uh, there's a great verse in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 21 and verse 21. And it, it tells us this is how they operated. They wouldn't do anything unless they, you know, they had guidance, uh, as it were. And so Exodus, uh, so Ezekiel 21, 21, book of Ezekiel 21, 21, it says, the king of Babylon stood at the parting of the way. So he's at a crossroads. Which way am I going to go? At the head of the two ways to use divination. He made his arrows bright. He consulted with images. He looked in the liver. In other words, he's, he's trying to discern uh, which way to go. Do I go this way? I'll go that way. And, and so he consults uh, and, and does uh, all of this um, basically guidance uh, from, from astrologers and all the rest of it to try and determine which direction to take. And so this process of casting per, um, that's the origin of the Feast of Purim. That's why that's why it's called Purim because it's an extension of is plural of the word pur, which is the lot, and so it's the lots casting the lots, and so that's the idea. I am is always a pluralizer in the Hebrew, and so it's uh, basically saying uh, the lots. It's that's what it's done, and so uh, th these lots uh, they they did it day to day until it the, they got a favorable outcome. And the favorable outcome was in the 12th month. And so they're doing it from the first month. And that it takes till the 12th month till they get a favorable outcome. And again, is not God involved in this? Uh, again, we've, we've often referred to this verse, a wonderful verse, Proverbs 16 and verse 33. It says, the lot is cast into the lap but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. And so, although God is not mentioned in the book of Esther, we keep saying that he's not mentioned, but he's overseeing the casting of the lot. And so that it gives a 12-month period in room for maneuverability, room to allow the possibility of the Jews finding a means of deliverance from this death sentence that is being pronounced upon them. So the long day between the first month and the 12th month would was again ordained of God, a 
allowing time for this wicked plan to be overruled. It's interesting that the process began in the month Nisan. <laughs> That's a very interesting thing, because that was the very month in which the Jews celebrated their deliverance from Egypt. That was the first month of their religious calendar when they had the Passover. Uh, so again, that's the very month when their deliverance as a nation from Egypt, their their nationhood's beginning really, was the time when this casting of lots took place. And so Haman said, verse 8, unto King Ahasuerus. I want you to notice that he doesn't mention the people by name. He didn't give the king the name of the people who were supposed to be subverting his kingdom. He just says, there is a certain people. It's much easier if we, we talk in generalities. We don't mention specific people or names. And so it, it, it just makes it easier. It's kind of less difficult on the conscience. And so uh, there's a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of the kingdom. And of course, that they were a, the, the Jewish diaspora. They had been spread throughout the empire. A dispersed people and in all the provinces of the kingdom, their laws are diverse from all the people. And that's true. They had a law given to them by God, the Mosaic law. They, so there's truth in what he's saying, but, but it's not the whole truth. Yes, they were different. Uh, and they did have their laws that were different from all the people. Uh, neither keep they the king's laws. Now, this is where there's an exaggeration. Normally, they were good law-abiding citizens. It wasn't that they, just that the one, the one law uh, which the king had brought into being, which was that everybody should bow to Mordecai, it was only that one that they had difficulty with, and only Mordecai, who was the one who had difficulty with that. But basically is saying there, they don't keep the king's laws. They are lawless people. It's not for the king's profit to suffer them. It's, it's not. And so instead of this being a personal thing about Mordecai, he, he spins it in such a way that this is this is a threat to the empire. This is this is not going to be good for the king if he allows these people to survive. And so he maliciously misrepresents and slanders these people. And of course, uh, slander always has a little bit of truth in it, but then it always twists it. And that's what he does. And he presents it in a way that presents the Jews as an unfavorable people and a threat to the whole empire. And that, of course, has, we've seen that, the, 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 uh, the whole uh, issue of the Holocaust, uh, there was this propaganda that the Jews are behind the loss of the First World War. It was all that, even though many of Jews were war heroes that fought bravely and gallantly for Germany at the war, but there's this generalization that they're the ones that are undermining things. And of course, he tried to present it in such a way that he was only thinking about the welfare of the king and his kingdom. And so this is his means. This is his plot. This is how he devises means to wipe out the Jewish people. And then he says in verse 9, if it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. So just to sweeten the deal, uh, if you sign this king, uh, I'm going to I'm going to bring 10,000 talents of silver uh, into the into the treasury. Uh, I'm going to uh, fill the, the coffers of the treasury if you will do this. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, this is how he sweetens the deal. Now, let's just say this, that Herod Herodotus, uh, the Greek historian uh, in his book, uh, book three, section 95 says this, the annual income of the entire Persian empire was 15,000 talents of silver. And Haman is offering to pay in 10,000 talents. That's two thirds of the actual gross national product, if you like, of the nation. So this is a huge amount. It's been worked out to be 375 tons of silver, which is 375,000 kilo kilograms 
of silver. This is a huge amount. And where did he expect to get it? Either Haman was either fabulously wealthy himself or he hoped to recoup this amount from the spoils taken from the Jews. And that does tell us something, doesn't it? Why was it that so few Jews went back when the opportunity was given for them to return to their own land? Was it that they were doing very well financially in their captivity? That they're doing so well that actually <laughs> uh, their combined wealth would almost be two-thirds of the, the wealth of the actual empire itself. And so it certainly would tell us that they had indeed, and of course, we do know that there are people that do tend to prosper. So they, they, you know, you, my home city of Leeds, you can, you can follow the migration of the Jews, uh, how they started out just in the inner city. And they were, they had sewing machines and they were tailors. And then as they got more prosperous, they moved out to an area called Moortown, which is very posh. And then eventually moved out to Harrogate and, and posher areas. And it's just inter interesting. You can see there are people that prosper. They really do prosper. Uh, and again, part of it is that they're blessed of God. And uh, unfortunately, uh, many of them don't give him the credit and the glory, but they are a prosperous people and they prospered in the empire. And so he's going to put that money in the coffers. And so verse 11, it says, the king said to Haman, the silver is given to thee, the people also to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. So the king, the king just says, oh, it's okay. Don't worry about, don't worry about the money. Now, if we just read that at face value, would think that he wasn't interested in the money. But don't forget, he's just come back from a very expensive, unsuccessful campaign against the Greeks. And the possibility of this huge amount of money going into the treasury of the king was very appealing. And so if you look at Esther chapter 4, verse 7, it says, and Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. And so basically what's going on here, and we're not given all the, the full details, but typical in the Middle East, uh, somebody uh, offers to pay something and the response is, oh, no, don't, don't do that. You, you can, you can, you, you, we don't need the money. And, and so they go through this process. And if I might illustrate, I'd like you to just look back at Genesis 23 to give the biblical uh, illustration of what we're talking about. It's kind of almost a game that they play. Oh, no, you can have it. Oh, no, you, no, go on, take the money. No, I don't want the money. Take the money. And you go through this, this whole uh, uh, kind of a, a back and forth, uh, Genesis 23, verse 11. This is Abraham wanting to buy a burial place uh, for uh, Sarah. And it says, Nay, my Lord, hear me, the field give I thee. This is uh, uh, Ephron the, uh, of the children of Heth. He says, The field I give thee, and the cave that is therein, I give it thee in the presence of the sons of my people, give I thee to thee, bury thy dead. And Abraham bowed down himself before the people of the land. There we got again, somebody showing reverence uh, to authority. He spake unto Ephron in the audience of the people of the land saying, but if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me, I will give thee money for the field. Take it of me and I will bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham saying unto him, my Lord, hearken unto me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? Bury therefore thy dead. And Abraham hearkened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver, which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, current money with the merchant. So generally, the way it goes is when money's offered, they will immediately say, oh, I don't want any money. But they're not what they're saying and what they mean are two different things. They really do want the money. But they got to go through this little process. And so certainly the, the money would go into the king's treasury. Um, and although the king initially declines it, he has every intention 
of getting that to fill up the depleted coffers after the unsuccessful Grecian campaign. And so verse 12, then were the king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month. And there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors that were over every province, to the rulers, every people of every province, according to the writing thereof, to every people after their language. In the name of King Ahasuerus was it written and sealed with the king's ring. So now king's signet ring is approving this mass genocide. It is now being sent out by the posts and it was signed on the 13th day it's kind of interesting the number 13 in scripture is a very interesting number isn't it it's the number of rebellion we see it i just read it this morning in genesis 14 um, where uh, the the rebellion against chedral omer was in the 13th year uh, we we see that uh, abraham uh, when uh, he failed to trust God and went into the, the maid Hagar, there was no communication between God and Abraham for 13 years. Let me just show you that. I just, again, just saw this recently, but it, 13 years because he was in rebellion. He was trying to do uh, the work of God in his own way and wanted, wanted it that way. Uh, Genesis 16 that says, verse, verse 16, Abraham was fourscore and six years old, 86, when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abraham. And when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, 99, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. So if you take 86 from 99, you get 13 years, 13 years of silence because uh, Abraham at that time was in rebellion against God's plan for his life. So 13, the number of rebellion. And so this rebel attempt to destroy the people that God had determined to bless is signed by the king. And the letters, verse 13, were sent by post to the king's provinces. And notice the language of the actual decree piling up terms here to destroy to kill to cause to perish what it's saying is this is a an absolute wiping out of the jewish race both young and old little children and women in one day even upon the 13th day of the 12th month which is the month adar and to take the spoil of them for a prey again 13th day signed on the 13th day it's to be executed on the 13th day and so interesting in the book of revelation satan or the dragon are mentioned 13 times just interesting the ultimate rebel and so here we have this great plan uh, to wipe out the jews and to destroy to kill to cause to perish it's it's total ethnic cleansing wiping the jews off the face of the earth and so the copy of the writing is for a commandment to be given in every province was published to all the people that they should be ready against that day so let's get ready for this you're going to be executing the, this plan and notice the king signing it the people are supposed to do it and what's haman doing he's not even mentioned <laughs> In other words, he's got other people to do the dirty work for him. And again, what a picture of Satan. Satan gets other people to do his dirty work for him. We've got to remember this. These politicians that are scheming in our day, uh, uh, they're not the enemy. They're victims of the enemy. He gets others to do his dirty work for him. We've got to keep reminding ourselves of this. And so it says, the posts went out being hastened by the king's commandment. And the decree was given in Shushan the palace. And the king and Haman sat down to drink. But the city, Shushan, was perplexed. Isn't it interesting? The callousness of what has just been enacted. And what do they do? They sit down to drink. 
another feast. Uh, they're they're having some drinks. It reminds me of uh, a very famous conference that was held in the Second World War called the Wanasi Conference, where all the the high ranking people of the Third Reich met together to come up with the final solution. And there they were in this beautiful resort, eating nice food, drinking all the rest of it. And there they are callously planning the execution and the wiping out of the race of the Jews. And that's exactly what we see here. It tells us that although they're kind of calm, cool, and collected about the whole thing, it says the city of Shushan was perplexed. People in the city, they knew Jews. They, they knew them personally. They did business with them. Maybe they were respecting of them, whatever. And they're perplexed about why has the king signed this, this command? Why is, he, why is he doing this? The people were perplexed. But you know, the good thing about the story, the book of Esther, is that God wasn't perplexed. God is on the throne. God is in control. He's not a little bit perplexed about the schemes and the plots of Haman. He is still going to accomplish his purposes. So the God whose name is never mentioned in Esther will not fail his people, even though they're really far from him in many ways. And it's good to know, isn't it? A, a great lesson for us, just to keep reminding ourselves. In the book of Daniel, I read it this morning in Genesis 14, three times, the most high God ruleth amongst the kingdoms of men. And even though this plan is all planned out to the absolute detail, but God, God is going to put a stop to all of it. By way of final application this morning, we might remember Amalek, of which Haman was a descendant. The word Amalek means warlike. And he's a type of the flesh who is out to destroy the people of God, to destroy our testimony, to destroy our usefulness, to cause our name to be mud. And we have to recognize that this is a perpetual battle. It never ends. And often when we're tired, when we're weary, when we're weak, Amalek shows up. And we desperately need the, the most high God <laughs> to fight our battles for us. Because, again, it says the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to another. We can't fight flesh with flesh. We have to depend on God, the spirit, to give us victory over that old enemy that wants to destroy us. So may God encourage us with this uh, awful chapter in many ways, and yet it leads to a wonderful deliverance that God himself, although not mentioned, is going to bring about. May God encourage us with these things. Amen.